an agreement on asylum seekers with the U.S. As President Trump reiterates his stance on enforcing legal immigration, the White House preparing for a high-stakes summit with China's leaders and House Republicans break out their subpoena power during their final weeks in the majority. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I am Trish Regan in for my friend Maria Bartiromo this morning, and this is Sunday Morning Futures. Mexico's new leadership denying a reported deal over President Trump's remain in Mexico policy for migrants seeking asylum. All this as the president threatens to shut down the government over border wall funding, as well as the southern border itself. We're going to get reaction from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to this one. House Republicans subpoena former FBI Director James Comey and former Attorney General Loretta Lynch as part of their investigation into misconduct at the DOJ and FBI leading up to the 2016 election. Will they finally get the answers they have been seeking before the Democrats take control of oversight? And President Trump will meet face to face with Chinese President Xi at the G20. Will both sides signal that they're ready to discuss a deal? We're certainly getting indications of that. Could we possibly end these escalating trade tensions and stop intellectual property theft? A preview of what to expect and what the president's message should be as we look ahead right here today on Sunday Morning Futures. Okay, but we're beginning right now with the incoming Mexican government at this point shooting down reports of a tentative deal with the Trump administration. A deal that would require asylum seekers to wait in Mexico while their claims go through the courts. The White House has not commented on those disputed reports, but President Trump remaining defiant on Twitter, saying, and I quote, Migrants at the southern border wall will not be allowed into the United States until their claims are individually approved in court. We only will allow those who come into our country legally. Other than that, our very strong policy is catch and detain. No releasing into the U.S. All will stay in Mexico. If for any reason it becomes necessary, we will close our southern border. There is no way that the United States will, after decades of abuse, put up with this costly and this dangerous situation. We're not going to do it anymore. Join me right now with Reaction Republican Congressman from Louisiana, Representative Mike Johnson. He's actually a former constitutional law attorney, and he sits on the House Judiciary Committee. He is also the incoming chairman of the Republican Study Committee, which is the largest caucus of conservatives in Congress. It is so good to have you here, Representative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Trish. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So what do you make of Mexico saying, yeah, no, not really going to happen? Well, the back and forth is just another uh, verification that we need to clean up our immigration system. We have an asylum crisis, and everyone knows that. We commend the president for doing his job. He clearly has the legal authority under Section 212 of the Immigration and, and Natural, uh, Nationality Act that Congress gave the president. He has the authority in the interest of national security to suspend asylum entry or to add restrictions. And so he sees this as a national security threat, many of us do, and we need to get on top of it. So his action right now is perfectly appropriate and we support it. Okay, so uh, there's this incoming government there in Mexico that says, no, 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 we really haven't struck any kind of asylum deal. Does it even matter? I mean, do we even need any kind of asylum deal with Mexico? Can't we say, all right, we're changing our policy, this is how it's gonna be? We, we can. Now, we're a very compassionate nation, but we're also a, a nation of laws, and, and so we've got to enforce those laws. We, we want to allow people refuge when they're seeking legitimate persecution, when they're in legitimate fear of persecution for their families' lives or their, their own lives. That's the way our legal standard has been over the years, but it's been abused in recent years. I mean, if you look at the statistics in 2015, the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration allowed 81% of persons who claimed asylum without showing any proof of that into the country. In, in uh, 2016, they allowed 88%. Basically, the word got out that this was a rubber stamp. <clears throat> you could come to America in a caravan or in large groups, and we would just allow you in, whether you had a credible fear and needed asylum or not. Mm -hmm. Those days are over. We've got to fix that problem. The president gets it. And
and this is the first step, a necessary step, I think, to clean it up. Right. You know, you, you think about uh, the asylum claim and how difficult it is and has been historically to make. And you also think about people that are coming here, sir, from faraway places, right? So if you're coming, for example, from Bangladesh or Pakistan, you have to get on the plane and get here, right, to make the asylum claim, which is actually kind of logistically, I would think, difficult because you need the right kind of visa in order to get on the plane in the first place. Very different than, say, illegally crossing a border opening. Well, that's right. And the crisis clearly is at the southern border. We have this Central American caravan now. Uh, the folks from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala who are headed our way, they're, they're not in credible fear, we believe, many or most of them, in fear of their lives. They just don't like the conditions in their home countries. That's not a standard that allows someone to come in and avoid our, our, our normal processes uh, to, to acquire citizenship in this country. Mm -hmm. We have to get on top of it. I introduced a bill early last year to clean up this asylum problem, to, to clarify what the credible fear standard is and make sure that it's not abused with fraud going forward. We passed Passed it through the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, it was made a part of the Goodlatte bill, the comprehensive immigration mm -hmm. bill reform that we got on the floor, but we didn't get it passed. We've mm -hmm. got to get right back to that. Congress can assist in this, and I think we have a duty to do that. Let me ask you about Mexico's part in all this and whether Mexico can be assisting in it. The president tweeting this morning, and I quote here, it would be very smart if Mexico would stop the caravans long before they get to our southern border, or if originating countries would not let them form it is a way they get certain people out of their country and dump in the U.S. no longer. Dems created this problem. No crossings, exclamation point. Um, you know, he's saying it would be smart if Mexico would do this, but I don't know if Mexico has the right incentive to be of any help whatsoever because as he goes on to point out, you know, they're getting some of the bad folks in some cases out. Uh, and I don't know why they would suddenly change their tune and say we're not going to allow it anymore. Do we really need to be putting more pressure right now on Mexico to do its part in all of this? I think that's what the president's trying to do, but we have a new administration coming in. They take office in Mexico, the new president, December 1st. So we're just, uh, we're right around the corner of having a new relationship with a new administration. I think that's going to be an important one for us. Mexico has an interest as well. They're concerned that Central American uh, migrants and refugees would be coming through Mexico in droves, caravan after caravan. If we don't stop this problem right now and address this crisis appropriately, Mexico and the U.S. are going to have similar problems. So I do think that they can be a partner with us. They should be. They're, they're, they should be an ally. Mm -hmm. I think they have an interest in doing so, and we'll see how that unfolds in the coming weeks. Okay, back to us for a second. Um, talk of a shutdown, potentially. I mean, if the president doesn't get the funding he has been asking for and asking for for this border wall or some kind of increased security plan, do we see a government shutdown? Well, we certainly hope so. Look, this is a national security interest of ours. We know that there are harmful uh, human traffickers, drug cartels who uh, take advantage of our porous border and have for years. We know that dangerous, radicalized terrorists come across the border undetected and, and find their way into the country and, and take refuge there, uh, plotting who knows what. We know that we have illegal opioids and, and uh, fentanyl and, and harmful drugs that come across the border every single day. So we have to get on top of this. It is a, a, a national security interest and a top priority of the president and the Congress, and we've got to make do on that. And you're willing to, to, to risk that government shutdown, right? I mean, because that's, you know, <laughs> tends well, not I, to go I, over well with Americans, um, and, and both parties wind up getting blamed and, and people are going to be even more angry with you than they are right now. But is that what it's going to have to come to? I don't think it's going to come to a shutdown. I think that you have people on both sides of the aisle who understand how important this is. There are disagreements about the details about how much wall you need and whether you need an actual physical wall or drone technology or all these other things. There are mm -hmm. details in the in the discussions about it. But I think overall everyone understands that this truly is a top priority and I don't think we're going to go to a shutdown over Democrats it. too, they understand it's a top priority? Well, I think quietly and uh, individually they do. They don't, uh, it's, it's not their party talking point as you know, but they understand that this is a crisis. Everybody can turn on the television and see that we've got a serious problem. We've got to get on, on top of it. Yeah, see sometimes I wonder if the talking point is more open borders and there's no way that Donald Trump and his administration will see one penny of taxpayer dollars going to any kind of uh, fortitude for that wall. I mean, I, I just wonder politically 
if they can even get there, sir. Right, because they have they've dug in their heels on this whole idea that somehow um, having borders is is not American, and so if they turn around and say, okay, we're going to put money into into financing a wall or financing drones or whatever it takes, uh, I don't know if it works for them. Well, it's a foolish uh, idea that we don't need borders, of course. And the open borders camp, I think, really is a, a minority in the Democrat Party, although they're very vocal. I think there are some, some reasonably minded people uh, on the committees of jurisdiction who understand that, that we've got to secure that border. And, and I'm, I'm confident and optimistic that we'll get it done. I don't think it's going to take a government shutdown, and I think we can get more of that wall funding. It's a necessity. It's a priority. And as you know, the Republicans are going to hold that line. <laughs> right. um, well, I'm going to be asking the Democratic congressperson about that very issue coming up next. So uh, stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, let me ask you where things are standing now uh, with James Comey and uh, your, your plans there and your colleagues' plans uh, to try and get some answers before Democrats uh, take hold of things. Listen, I serve on the House Judiciary Committee. I commend our chairman, uh, Bob Goodlatte, for, for subpoenaing uh, Director Comey, former Director Comey, and former Attorney General uh, Lynch, because we have a lot of questions that remain unanswered. We've been uh, engaging in this joint investigation with the House Oversight Committee uh, for, for more than a year and a half, and we still have lots of question marks. So we've got to get this done. I think it's an appropriate thing to have that hearing. A at the end of the day, we have a, re a constitutional responsibility for oversight of our justice system, and we have to make sure that our, that our top law enforcement agencies are not acting with political bias mm -hmm. or that they have some sort of political agenda. That's critical to our institutions, to our, our rule of law, and, and we take that seriously. So we're looking forward to that. that, uh, that and hearing. you've got questions for Loretta Lynch, too. Absolutely. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the attorney general uh, is where the buck stops, and she was uh, in charge of all of this, and so she has a lot of the answers that we need as well. And, and, and from my perspective, you know, the, the chairman Goodlatte has asked for a closed-door hearing. Uh, I saw that uh, Mr. Comey objected to that, but whether it's closed-door or open-door, the point is we have to get answers to the questions that remain unanswered. And I think that's important to us. It's important to the American people. And, and again, we have an obligation to provide that. Representative Johnson, thank you so much. Good to see you here today. You just heard everyone the Republican perspective on the Trump administration's battle over asylum. Now we get to hear from the other side. Democratic Congressman Jim Hines on whether migrants should have to wait in Mexico while their claims are processed. And one point of view I want to bring in Connecticut Congressman Jim Hines. He's the chairman of the New Democrat Coalition. He sits on the House Intelligence Committee. It's good to see you, sir. Welcome. Hi, Trish. So what do you think? What should we be doing right now at the southern border as we watch thousands trying to pour in and thousands more try and seek asylum, hopefully the right way? Yeah, well, you know, that's exactly the right question to ask. And, um, you know, I think most people understand that if you've got a problem, probably the smart way to solve the problem is to go to the root cause of that problem. Uh, and so, look, I don't get too excited about, you know, whether there are American judges on the Mexican side of the border determining the uh, validity of asylum claims or whether it happens on the other side of the border. You know, the reality is we don't have a national security crisis around asylum seekers. We've never had an act of fatal violence committed by an asylum seeker. Right. These are people who may or may not be fleeing uh, danger and violence so in their own countries. So do you dispute countries. what but the administration is, is saying, sir, about 500 felons among this group? They're lying about it. They're just flat out lying okay, about so the Department national security of threat associated security with the caravan. is lying by telling us that there are 500 known felons. The, the Department of Homeland Security does not know who is in that caravan. The president, of course, outright lied when he said that there are Middle Easterners in that caravan. And my colleague, by saying that uh, terrorists are sneaking across the border, is also not being honest. Now, look, I'm not saying that a secure border is not important. A secure border is important, but you solve a problem by understanding it. And to get back to my previous okay, point, so I, what's I just important want to fully here, understand Trish, is because you're, you're making some pretty strong accusations there, saying that Department of Homeland Security and the President of the United States all seem to be in cahoots and want to convince the American people that uh, these are bad people. Um, and that is just, in your view, frankly, a lie. So uh, who is in that group? No, no, it's, 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 not, it's not in my view, right? So the president says that there are scary Middle Easterners, and his government says Do you actually we have no the evidence of that. intelligence community's gatherings here that, that have said there are 500 felons? 
and other bad so actors. So I, as a member of the Intelligence Committee, oversee the intelligence community. And no, it is not true that the government knows that there are 500 felons in that caravan. So mm -hmm. what is happening here, Trish, and you and I both know this. And by the way, I'm not so saying border is security caravan, isn't sir? important. I, do, do, describe well, to me who exactly is in the caravan. You know, Trish, I can't do that because uh, I have not actually gone and talked to who's in the caravan, and neither has the Department of Homeland Security. And the notion that the president is not lying, let's just say it, when really? he says because there are uh, Middle uh, Easterners Democrats in the caravan, are, are he's lying. upset, Representative, that we have some paid informants there uh, in, in the caravans themselves. I mean, our intelligence has, has done some gathering and, and we have paid people uh, and that's been a big dispute. I mean many Democrats don't like the idea that taxpayer dollars are going to actually pay people that uh, become effectively CIA informants but that is what we have there um, and so that's Trish, where that intelligence is coming from. everything you have just said is not Look, Trish, I, I, part of my job is overseeing the intelligence community, and everything you just said is not true. Democrats, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. The way we solve this problem, and no, we don't have CIA agents running around inside the caravan. The way we solve this issue is by working with countries like El Salvador and Honduras. So you don't right. have any information, do no intelligence gathering about who's actually in the group? That seems kind of irresponsible. Not much. Sir. Not enough to be mm -hmm. able to say with any certainty that there are 500 felons in that group, which nobody is saying. Okay. So my point so is, if we can get back to what on. really matters. No, somebody is saying that. The Department of Homeland Security is saying that. But let's move on from that, uh, because you're saying everybody's just great that, that wants to come here. So what's your answer? Open up the border? Trish, did I say that, that, did I, did I say everybody's just great who wants to come here? Because now you're lying. Congressman. Did I say who's that? Who's in the group? Who's in, you said there's no 500 felons. So tell me, everybody good? Trish, everybody I good? I do not know who's in the group. The president does okay. not know Don't who's in the group. The real conversation, the real conversation here is about know. how do we keep, I think what we should do is we should stop these caravans from originating in countries like El Salvador and Honduras. Don't you think that's probably the solution? I think that's a great idea. I'd like to see uh, places like El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala right, do their right. part, especially since exactly. we give them so much in financial aid. Exactly. So the way to solve this problem is not to scare Americans that there's Middle Easterners or criminals or felons. The way to stop this problem, of course, is to work with El Salvador and Honduras to try to reduce yeah. the violence and the gang so violence in their countries, which stops in people Honduras from fleeing. And Guatemala and, and help them to uh, prop up their economies. I, I, I get it. I see where it's going, right? This is, this is what we do, right? We help mm. other countries, partly because we're a good country, but we help other Was countries. Was leaving in the first place? We're spending a lot of money in these places as it is. What more do you think we should be doing? We could be doing a lot more, Trish, to reduce the amount of gang violence uh, and violence generally in these countries. And look, we've got a long tradition, starting with the Marshall Plan back after World War II, of helping countries develop their economy and stability, because at the end of the day, it helps us. So look, we can spend the next 50 years talking about how to deal with caravans and migrants at the border, or we could get at the underlying problem. I think most people understand that it makes sense to try to help solve the underlying problem if you want it to go away. What about the here and now? I mean, what do you do about the immediate crisis of thousands of people trying to come to the United States? Well, when you say crisis, of course, illegal border crossings are down year on year. Obviously, we need more secure borders, so don't try to pin wanting open borders on Democrats or on me. I'm in, but, I, well, um, let, me, let me just jump in there because that's an important thing that you said. You believe that we need more secure borders. Yes? Absolutely, as, as, as pretty much every Democrat does. Uh, our borders need to be secure, no question about that. So would you work with the president? Would you work with Republicans to try and secure our border there with Mexico? Of course I would, as would most, uh, as would most Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, secure borders are really important. I understand it's important, as you said earlier, to tell the American people that Democrats are for open borders, but that is not true. We understand, uh, just me, as all Americans do, that we need borders. words in my mouth uh, now, because I never borders. actually said that it's somehow important. Listen. Here's the deal. You have a crisis when right now. When you were now. talking you to my colleague, you said the Democratic policy is to, is to push for open borders. You have I, I heard you say it. Well, well I, I, look, I mean, what was a, the gubernatorial candidate that uh, lost and is on her uh, apology sour grapes tour, uh, Stacey Abrams, had talked about allowing 
illegals to vote. We heard in San Francisco, uh, well, they're, they're actually doing it with the, the school board there. You're allowed to vote even if you're in this country illegally. And the concern is, as you see your party grow increasingly um, radical to the left, and I'm not saying you're there. I mean, you're from Connecticut. <laughs> but it, it, it's a concern that part of the goal is to get more people here so that they can get more votes. I, I'm glad that you're I, saying I, that's not in, in, your, in your wheelhouse and you don't want to do that. And you do want safer, safer borders. So how do you get it done in such a divided environment right now, especially when there's talk of a shutdown? Do you foresee a shutdown of the government as a result of this border crisis. Well, well, let me get back to something you said earlier. You said the party is becoming ever more left. We took the majority with 40 seats, picking up seats in places like Kansas, Oklahoma, South Carolina, three seats in Virginia. Look, you can, you can uh, uh, run Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who won a deep blue seat in Queens, all you like. The reality is that the House Democratic Caucus picked up seats in purple and red areas, Oklahoma and Kansas, that will actually make for a caucus in the House of Representatives, which is probably more centrist and more pragmatic than Good. it was before, because these people who come out of Oklahoma and Kansas, mm -hmm. of course, are not going to be exactly like the people who come out of deep blue districts. So that. what do we do? Uh, we go back to a place place where we were, you know, back in 20, uh, 2013, I guess it was, when you had strong bipartisan support for, yes, more border security, but of course for trying to get at the underlying causes. People come here because they're fleeing violence. Let's see if we can address the violence where they're fleeing. They also come here because where they come from, they might make $2 a day in a place like Stanford, Connecticut. They can make multiples of that. So mm -hmm. let's, you know, really get at the underlying economic causes, meaning let's crack down on contractors and restaurants and cleaning services that are actually hiring the undocumented in the United States. Let's make sure people have a way of proving that they're entitled to work here. If you do those things, you're going to spend a lot less time focusing on what's actually happening at the border because you'll get at the underlying causes of why people are trying to get yeah, into our I, country. I don't dispute that. I think that it, you, know, you have to have a comprehensive approach here. Um, but again, I just go back to trying to deal with the sort of immediacy of the situation. And it's certainly a challenging one because you can't just say, okay, everybody come on in. Um, but is shutdown possible over this issue? Well, I think it'll be interesting to see that. You know, um, uh, it really is in the president's hands. I mean, the president wasn't in power, of course, when we did have that brief shutdown associated with Ted Cruz and the Affordable Care Act. You know, I heard you say earlier that it's going to tick people off at both parties. If the president of the United States, who already is a, a historically unpopular president, is seen as causing the uh, inconveniences and other problems associated with the, gov uh, with the, uh, with the government shutdown, it's going to be a real political problem for him. It won't be the Democrats in the no, House of Representatives yeah, no, I, that are I, shutting I down the everybody. government. It'll be the president. Don't worry. There's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Congress uh, is not very high on, on anyone's list. Um, but let me just uh, quickly ask you, speaking of that, uh, someone uh, who is uh, trying to position herself again for another big job there is Nancy Pelosi. And uh, it, it seems as though she's... She's the one in line. Do, do you agree with having Nancy Pelosi there as speaker, or do you worry that the party needs new people, new faces, uh, in light of the challenges you guys have faced? Well, look, uh, both are true, right? I mean, you know, we obviously, when the top three people in the House of Representatives are in their late 70s, it would be good for us to have a more diverse group generationally. I mean, if you're my age and younger, and there are plenty of folks younger, uh, you know, you sort of want a more diverse group generationally. But let me tell you this. I mean, the attack on Nancy Pelosi was, prior to the election, that she's such a drag on the electoral prospects of Democrats, you can't win with Nancy Pelosi. Holy smokes, did that criticism turn out to be wrong. Not only did we retake the majority in the House of Representatives, we won in places we'd never imagined we could win, like Oklahoma, like Kansas, uh, like South Carolina. Um, and so the premise that Nancy Pelosi somehow keeps the Democrats from winning, look, you just need to look at what happened three weeks ago to know that that is not true. Mm -hmm. It's a good fundraiser. <laughs> anyway, good to see you. Congressman Hines, very good to see you. Thank you Thank for you, joining Trish. the program. Okay, what Take should it. we expect from the block on March 29th? But nothing's exactly guaranteed, of course. The deal still needs parliamentary approval before negotiations on new trade or security relations can actually begin. Joining me right now, Christian Whiten 
a former senior advisor in the Trump and George W. Bush administrations. He's also a senior fellow for strategy and public policy at the Center for the National Interest. Uh, also, the author of Smart Power, Between Diplomacy and War. Lots of credentials. Christian, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. Okay, so what should we think of this Brexit thing? Is it getting any closer? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think what really this is is the beginning of the end of Theresa May's career. What she has um, sold to the Europeans is just a real stinker. This thing does not achieve Brexit, really. It betrays Brexit. It will keep uh, Britain in the European trade union, their sort of their, their, um, their trade tariffs and customs. Um, all it does is, is delay the, what Britain really needs, which is to negotiate a free trade agreement with us and look to a post-Brexit future. Uh, and as you point out, this is very unlikely to pass Parliament. Over 100 members of Theresa May's party will probably vote no. Uh, Labor, the Lib Dems vote no. So it's probably dead on arrival. Is Theresa May part of the problem then? I mean, it, I don't think she ever totally bought in, right? I mean, she she's different than, say, some of the others that really got behind Brexit. Um, is, is she one of the reasons, or some might even say the primary reason, why this just hasn't gotten off the ground the way it should? She is. She sort of demonstrated that she is politically talentless through this. She never had her heart in the matter. Uh, she was for Remain. She voted against Brexit. Uh, it was sort of odd to make someone from that disposition prime minister mm -hmm. uh, after her predecessor quit. A number of ministers, uh, even some who were willing to split the difference on Brexit, uh, have left her cabinet, including the person in charge of negotiating the Brexit deal with the EU. So really, the wheel seemed to be coming off the, uh, of the car. Let me ask you, Christian, about G20 now, because, uh, you know, Obviously, China's been very much in the news and in the headlines, especially with this president, who's taken on some of these trade issues and the theft of intellectual property in a way that we just haven't seen uh, quite so openly before. Are we going to get anywhere? Are we going to get any closer to, to you know, seeing some kind of stop to the IP theft or to some of the tariffs? I think we will eventually get there, and it's very important. President Trump is the first president to really draw a line and push back on the Chinese. However, the idea we're going to get to some big deal on the sidelines of the G20, G20 summits are always irrelevant. Uh, this will be an important meeting. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I think President Trump is, is bending over backwards to be open to making a deal. But if you look at the Chinese uh, dictator, Xi Jinping, the strongman, he really doesn't appear to be in a, in a position yet, in a mood yet, to make the major reforms that are necessary. China's economy is based so much on stealing foreign technology. And uh, he's in a politically weak position himself. The economy there is slowing down. If you look at his conduct at APEC, uh, Vice President Pence was down there for that. Uh, rude, belligerent Chinese uh, leader there. And if you look at what their focus is so far in Buenos Aires, they seem to be very focused on protocol, who gets to attend what meeting and where they're going to sit, and less on sort of <laughs> any indication or signal that change is coming. Well, um, turning now to the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee uh, issuing, uh, or rather, <clears throat> Christian, uh, I, I think, am I going to goodnight you here? All right, I'm going to let you, <laughs> sorry for the uh, lack of eloquence on that one, sir, but I'm going to let you go uh, on that note. Hopefully something mm -hmm. better comes out of G20. And now I'm going to turn, of course, to the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee who are issuing subpoenas for James Comey and Loretta Lynch to testify behind closed doors. It's all part of their investigation into the DOJ's actions leading up to the 2016 election. Mr. Comey responding on Twitter saying he's happy to testify but wants to do it in public. Here to talk about all of it, none other than Professor Alan Dershowitz, law professor emeritus at Harvard Law School, also the author of the case against impeaching Trump. Good to see you. Good to see you. In Thank person. You. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, your take on this? I mean, is, is this a last-ditch effort? Well, both sides are abusing the investigatory process. Um, investigations are supposed to lead to legislation. That's the role of Congress. And yet they use these for revenge, to get even, to score political points. It's just wrong. It's wrong when the Democrats do it. It's wrong when the Republicans do it. And it's foolish the Republicans doing it now because the Democrats are coming in. They're just <laughs> going to do it twice as much or three times as much. And the American public is going to just be paying for subpoena after subpoena, testimony after testimony, and we're not going to learn it. So all you these do? investigations, and yet, I mean, you've been so critical of the Mueller investigation yeah. from the very beginning. You think it's a waste of time, a waste of taxpayer dollars? I do. I think there should have been investigations of specific crimes by sitting U.S. attorneys. 
But I do think there should have been a nonpartisan commission set up to look into the Russian influence on the election without necessarily trying to indict anybody or pointing fingers. We would have learned something. We're not learning anything from these investigations. By the way, I think Comey is right. If he's going to be interrogated, let him do it in public, because we know that otherwise things are selectively leaked. Yeah. So uh, there's yeah, no I don't blame him. I don't blame him for that either. And you know, and I. I like to see what's going on. Of I like to know, um, as a citizen, what are they asking him? What is he saying? Uh, and have that unfiltered version of, of, of these what is secret, going on. These, these secret investigations are all gotcha. You know, oh, we'll ask you questions in secret. Maybe you'll say something that contradicts somebody else, and maybe then we can send it over for further investigation by the Justice Department. Look, I think the American public wants to see bipartisan work. We now have a Democratic House coming in in January. Let them work together. Let them produce legislation. Legislation on immigration, legislation on health care, legislation on the environment. You're right. But this you're, 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 idea of, as though that's going to happen. Right. I mean. But the idea of just spending all the time on investigations, and they're not investigations. They're just gotchas. They're just it's trying to get hunts? even political. Well, I wouldn't use that term, but they are political events designed to score points for their party. And that's just not the right way See, to use it, Congress. I, I agree with you. And I worry that increasingly we're seeing this breakdown in Washington where, they're, as you say, they're not looking at mm -hmm. actually meaningful immigration reform or other policies that will get us forward. But rather it's, you know, how do we how do we stick it? To the other side. Mm -hmm. I anticipate a lot of investigations coming forward now that you've got the, the Democrats in charge of the House. Sure. First of all, the 2020 presidential campaign has begun already. So uh, we're going to see everything geared to 2020, to the congressional races, to the Senate races, to the presidential race. We're going to see politics for the next two years. <laughs> and, you know, whether the Republicans win or the Democrats win, the American public loses. How do we ever get anything done? I mean, it's amazing, right, that, you know, that this country functions as well when, as it does. I grew up at a time when Ted Kennedy was friendly with Orrin Hatch, when Joe Biden got along with people on the other side of the aisle. Uh, today, it's become so contentious, so partisan, so divisive, that again, I have to say it, the American public is the loser. We don't want this squabbling in Washington. We want to see something get done. That's for sure. That's for sure, Alan. Uh, so good to see you. Uh, at this time, uh, there are some mixed messages over a report that the Trump administration struck a deal with Mexico's incoming government over asylum seekers at the southern border. Uh, we're going to talk about that, so don't go anywhere. Alan Dershowitz is back right after this. Uh, the question being that if there is movement on what would amount to a major policy overhaul, what would it be? Will it be considered? Is it a political win for the president? Alan Dershowitz is back, as well as our panel, Ed Rollins, and former Senator Aldemato here to weigh in as we look ahead today on Sunday Morning Futures.